Matt Worker is, a, is the uh, staff cartoonist for Politico, your prize winning political cartoonist. How political cartoons uh, can break through power. Okay, uh, greetings. I offer you salutations from the all powerful mainstream media. Resistance is futile. Yes, the mainstream media, or as Donald Trump likes to call us, the, the pack of lying scumbags. Um, everybody seems to hate us these days, but, uh, but don't hate me. I, uh, I started out doing lots of cartoons for Public Citizen back in the 1980s. I've done some Project Censored covers back in the 1980s. Multinational Monitor, Robert Weissman's great magazine, um, and the Hightower Lowdown. But now I work for Politico, and I'm trying to figure out how to survive in this new media landscape. So, um, and the silly hat, besides trying to impress you and intimidate you, um, is also to help convey uh, my main point today. And that is, even though you, uh, you all may be very serious about very serious work, don't forget a little humor often helps. Bringing a little levity to the fight is a good thing. Peter Ustinov put it this way, Comedy is simply a funny way of being serious. Um, I had the great good fortune to work for my good buddy as staff artiste for Jim Hightower's Lowdown for nearly 10 years. And back when I was also doing regular cartoons and illustrations for Public Citizen, um, uh, Hightower was kind enough to, to write an introduction for a book of mine. And uh, it makes the best case to always remember Mr. Humor. So I want to read a little bit from Hightower's introduction to the book. This is from the sort of middle of his argument. Um, yes, working for social change is serious business. And yes, indeed, it's a grim world out there. But hey, nobody likes a grouch. Whether your humor is broad, boisterous, and bodacious, or sly, wry, and petite, whatever you've got, to turn, you, you've got to turn that sucker loose. Mr. Humor is not our enemy. Indeed, he is our friend. So be not afraid of Mr. Humor. He's there to keep us sane and also to open doors. He, he when he arrives in your head, do not reject Mr. Humor. He's there to help. So, uh, so I've, got, I've got basically three main points that um, I want to leave you with today. Um, and uh, so as not to embarrass myself like Texas Governor Rick Perry, I borrowed a brilliant idea from Sarah Palin. So, um, and uh, Feel free to uh, write these down on your own hands so you can take them home and think about them. Um, point one again, I'll, I'll set this up at the beginning and then I'll show you some cartoons and hopefully this will illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, point one, remember using humor. Bringing levity to your argument is always a good idea. Point two, the media landscape is changing fast. We're well into what I would call the brave new short attention span media age. Point three, um, this new media age is to be found in our pockets, online. People are getting their information and forming their opinions on little screens, in a visual... It, it, the important thing to know about the online media, and everything seems to be going online, is that it's fundamentally a visual medium. Point four, in this mostly visual environment and short attention span age, nothing communicates better than that rich, chewy nugget of enlightenment known as the political cartoon. I know this is the same as having a barber tell you that the world would be better if everyone just got a haircut. But it's true. So, so hear me out. I'm going to make my case with uh, some cartoons. Um, we're living in this short attention span age where we're full of distractions and there's a million different platforms and publications vying for our attention, especially during a political season like we've got now. Um, and one of the main features over the last 10 years is it, as, as problematic as the big bad mainstream media may be, a lot of the big bad mainstream media is actually dying out. I've been working in, in the newspaper business going back to the 1970s, and the newspaper business is going away and it's being replaced by a lot of other things. In the last, since the uh, onset of the recession in 2007, 2008, the statistic of the number of full-time, fully employed journalists who have lost their jobs, I mean, these are positions that have been eliminated, is about 40,000. 
And those are hardworking reporters reporting what's going on in city hall, in state government, in federal government. If you go over here to the National Press Club in Washington, where there used to be dozens of newspaper bureaus covering what's going on in Washington for the local pe people, albeit for the corporately owned or family owned daily newspaper, at least they were covering the news. Those people are going away. It's like the, uh, the, the big serious lion tamers at the circus are, are losing their jobs and their platform. People are not paying for that kind of journalism and it's being replaced by opinion journalism and this crazy sideshow. Uh, and then there's the social media, which is a whole other thing that we're starting to grapple with. And Twitter, you know, Twitter is a very interesting place to go, but this is a cartoon I just did last week. And um, Twitter is a place where, you know, idealistically, one would hope that there would be great civic discourse, but most of the time, it's just people trolling each other. So the little Twitter bird is turning into the angry birds. Um, in this landscape exist these archaic creatures like myself, political cartoonists. And for some reason, we don't go away, and for some reason, we cause more trouble than we should, especially given how archaic we are. This is because our, our craft goes way, way back. Um, and and, and we, we also, we operate in a particularly odd place in the media. Um, for some reason, we rile people's feathers. Um, this is a cartoon that Tom Tolls did back in 2004. And um, it generated, a, can you read the uh, caption? I can't, sure, I can read it for you. It's Rum, Rumsfeld saying, I'm list listing your condition as battle-hardened. <laughs> This cartoon generated a letter signed by the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff who demanded that tolls be fired. Um, you know, lots of other people wrote blistering things, but there was something about this that, that required a response from the Joint Chiefs. Then, of course, there's Barry Blitz's famous cover in 2008 that, that a lot of people misinterpreted on both sides of the political spectrum. And, um, and everybody was out for Mr. Blitz's head. Um, Ali Frizat, a very brave Syrian cartoonist who was nearly killed by Assad's thugs, um, uh, uh, again, uh, singling out the cartoonist. Um, this goes all the way back to the, sort of the beginning of political cartooning. I mean, political cartooning goes back to Ben Franklin, the revolutionary era here and abroad. In France, this is a famous cartoon that Damier did of the king of France as a pair. And, um, for this, um, he was thrown in jail, and um, uh, along with his publisher. Uh, I'm move right along here since we're tight on time. And then, of course, there's Thomas Nass, the granddaddy of American editorial cartooning, who gave us um, elephants and donkeys, as well as sort of the contemporary notion of Santa Claus. And uh, Nast was famous for taking on Tammany Hall in New York, a horribly corrupt administration that controlled the city and was emptying the city coffers. And, um, and he went after them head on in the uh, newspaper in New York and eventually toppled the administration. And Boss Tweed, who's pictured here after the toppling, um, uh, 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 uttered the famous line. He came into the uh, publisher's office furious about what Nast was drawing about him and his henchmen. And, and he uttered the famous line. I don't care what you write in your damn newspapers, my constituents don't read, but stop the damn pictures. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and the end of the story, which is wonderful, is Tweed ran off to Spain and, uh, to, to evade arrest, and uh, he was spotted on a Spanish boat uh, by a crew member who recognized him from NAS cartoons, and, uh, and he was arrested. Um, and then, of course, the most contemporary example of the strange staying power of cartoons is the uh, Danish cartoon controversy that unfortunately bleeds into the Charlie Hebdo tragedy. And um, it speaks to this sort of strange power of, of, a, of a cartoon, this thing where you, com you, you combine uh, a, a, a political message with a little bit of humor and some drawing, and you put it into this form. It's not like a tweet. In fact, the old saw about a picture's worth a thousand words must mean that a cartoon is worth about 8.5 tweets or something like that. Um, but but it, the, the magic of it is that it communicates with other nonverbal parts of your brain. And for some reason that seems to enrage people in a way that the verbal enragement doesn't. Um, there's a, 
there's an uh, the, 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 this this there are different theories I have about this, and um, one of them is the evolutionary theory, which goes back to the fact that it's we were probably we were pre-language for many many thousands of years, and during that time. My theory is that the first people that were dealing with the world of media were uh, cartoonists. And so uh, the birth of cartooning corresponds with the birth of civilization. And so we had, uh, we had for millions of years only people reading cartoons. And there weren't even captions. And then, uh, and then we've stuck around, but we've had to share that space now with all these other communicators who use these strange things like the written word and, and, and now broadcast media and stuff like that. Um, so here we are in the present day, and uh, uh, it, surviving as a cartoonist, I, I worked for uh, a bunch of different newspapers and magazines as a freelancer, and um, I started 10 years ago with Politico here in Washington. And um, it's been very interesting working in a big newsroom in DC and trying to figure out how you, you survive and how you break through the noise. And um, again, uh, uh, to keep boosting for cartoons, there's something that touches certain parts of the brain about a cartoon. Uh, the word caricature, I just learned this recently, comes from the Italian word caricare, which means to load as in loading a vessel or loading a weapon, which I just love. So a caricature has this powerful metaphorical ability to cut through the noise. Um, and back to this notion of the short attention span age that we're living in, um, my son, who's in his 20s, and most of his friends, they don't read conventional media. They don't read newspapers. They don't watch television. Most of the news that they get comes from uh, social media, um, uh, if they get it at all, um, we're, we're into this, uh, this, this post, in a certain sense, a post news, post fourth estate era in, in the media. This is a cartoon I did back of when the LA Times first was sold to Sam Zell. Yay for the LA Times, yeah. They're, they're, they're still for sale, no one wants to buy it. Yeah. Uh, but working as a cartoonist, I really firmly believe that we, there, there are ways you can, even though the deck is stacked against you, if you're clever, if you're funny, if you're visual, there are ways to, uh, to break through the noise. Um, we, we live in an age of all sorts of gridlock, and um, I, I, I think that there's, we need to become creative and artistic and, um, and witty. And, um, and put stuff out there, and we can compete in the, the social media space with, with, with good stuff. And it's not, it, 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 again, it's to, to quote um, my, my good friend Jim Hightower, it's, uh, it's a matter of don't forget about Mr. Humor. So thank you very much. Okay, hey, uh, now we're talking about overcoming the gatekeepers. We're going to stick a little bit with humor, as Jim Hightower, maybe one of the uh, panelists on this. He, people know him probably from yesterday. He was MC, and they probably know him also from his uh, writing, articles, and books, and his radio commentary, which are on a daily basis. His website, jimhightower.com, is where to follow him, and, and I'm sure he'll use his uh, combination of commentary, uh, humor, sarcasm uh, and the, his other tools to to advocate on behalf of those of us who really have no voice in Washington, which he's been doing now for decades. Uh, we're also going to see a return of uh, uh, Jeff Chester for the Center for Dis Digital Democracy. We are blessed with a full range of, uh, of uh, independent mediaites, uh, folks who found their way around uh, the corporate blockage. Uh, we'll get better at 120 alternative weeklies, which are now, in many cases, larger than the dailies in the cities uh, where they exist. Uh, uh, my friend John Weiss is uh, here in the audience somewhere. He's in Colorado Springs, a major force in a city uh, thought to be as right-wing as he can possibly get, uh, yet his newspaper uh, and his efforts uh, in politics there have uh, created a whole new dynamic uh, in that city. Uh, and I think his paper is probably bigger than the Colorado Springs uh, uh, daily uh, 
that is there. But we have also, obviously, the nation, the progressive, uh, in these times, Mother Jones, progressive populist, fair, you know, et cetera, uh, et cetera. We've got free speech TV. And now this is becoming bigger and bigger. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, but a guy named Ron Williams has taken it over. Uh, and, uh, and Laura Flanders is on that. Uh, Tom Hartman is, is on that. Andy Goodman, uh, et cetera. Uh, a major TV network is developing uh, in our very uh, presence. Uh, and now with the uh, uh, decentralization, that's not quite the word, but anyway, of the, uh, of the cable TV uh, possibility, uh, this TV can become our new progressive network. Now that MSNBC is shrinking back, uh, owned by Comcast, and is going to, uh, going to become just a, a regular uh, middle of the road corporate uh, network, uh, free speech TV can be ours. Uh, it's already reaching uh, more than a, a million uh, listeners, regular uh, viewers, uh, on that uh, channel. And now they're adding other people to it, getting a new studio here in uh, Washington and expanding. So we have to create our own media, is all I'm saying. And then we've got the hundreds of uh, community radio stations. Uh, we've got voices like Tom Hartman, Amy Goodman, uh, Laura Flanders, uh, Ralph Nader, etc. And then cartoonists like Matt Worker and Tom Tomorrow, Jen Sorensen, uh, Brian Duffy, uh, Tom Tolls, uh, etc. I hate cartoonists because they get it. They, in a very limited space, they present the whole case and then they draw you a picture of it. We, we have no talent <laughs> that can achieve anything like that. I can give an English speech or, uh, or do a hundred commentaries and they do it uh, in a flash. And then we've got hundreds of thousands of young video makers, hundreds of thousands more social media uh, journalists. Uh, they've become a huge force, I think the force uh, for the future, uh, though it will the powers that be, of course, are trying to capture it, but they haven't captured it yet. The Bernie Sanders campaign would not exist except for social media. Uh, he, he came to Austin, gave 17 hours notice to the local campaign. They had 10,000 people at that location uh, the next morning. They began lining up at 6 a.m. That was done by social media. <laughs> So we do have our own media outreach. And when the establishment media ignores uh, Bernie, which is uh, just every single day of the week, uh, then uh, social media is spreading uh, the word of what he's saying. Uh, so we're not without media power, is all I'm saying. So, and, and I'm gonna offer uh, two uh, suggestions uh, for our media future. Uh, as, we, as more of us move into this, uh, that uh, aside from connecting more people to these independent media outlets, uh, I think there's two things that Indian media uh, needs to work on. Uh, one, our presentations uh, need less statistics and more storytelling. Uh, facts are good, despite what uh, the uh, right-wing freak show that's uh, running over there in the Republican primary with the Donald and the Cruz and Fiorina and uh, sleepy, sneezy, dopey, uh, <laughs> curly and low. Uh, but facts are good, but as punctuation points, not as the whole text. Uh, there is a reason that the first four letters uh, in numbers uh, spells none. Uh, uh, you know, you can overdo that. Uh, we need to rather relate to people uh, through stories, which is how they ha have historically, as Matt uh, Worker was just indicating, uh, understood uh, big concepts and, uh, and big stories. Van Jones, our, our friend, uh, was with him on a program once, and uh, he was chastising uh, the, the liberals for dumping just loads, wheelbarrows of statistics uh, on an audience. Uh, and he pointed out that Martin Luther King Jr. at the Lincoln Memorial over here in 1963 did not say, I have a position paper. <laughs> he said, I have a dream. And then he painted that dream, and we need more of that. My friend Deanna Zant, uh, who's on the board of the High Tower Lowdown and is our uh, social media guru, uh, she's a, a powerhouse in, in that whole world. And when, uh, when the uh, right wing uh, went after Planned Parenthood, uh, th there was a response uh, by uh, women's groups all around the country saying, send money to Planned Parenthood. But Deanna thought, well, what about people who don't have money to send to Planned Parenthood, or much money at least? So she started a, uh, a social media platform uh, called Planned Parenthood Saved My Life and just invited people to tell stories. And they got five million new emails out of that at Planned Parenthood. 
because of the stories that came across. That was a powerful force for the people who told the stories and then those who received uh, those stories. So our, our treasure trove of progressive media sources uh, needs to do one other thing, and that is to connect more, uh, coordinate a little bit, cooperate, uh, collude even uh, on occasion. The right wing does this all the time. The point is we could amplify our message in, if instead of, say, a story on Barack Obama submitting his Trans-Pacific Partnership tomorrow. Uh, so somebody will do a story on that, and he could move to the show, and, you know, and that'll be it. It'll be a little scattered thing. But what if, instead of that, uh, the 40 of these independent weeklies ran a story uh, uh, tying it to local actions? What if uh, Amy Goodman and Tom Hartman and uh, Laura Flanders and et cetera, et cetera, uh, did in the same week broadcasts uh, on that? Maybe several broadcasts uh, on that. Uh, what, if, what if the cartoonists ran cartoons you know, on, the, on their own? They, they, you know, nobody's going to direct their drawing, but take their own, do their own take uh, on it. Uh, what if the national magazines uh, ran stories uh, on it? Uh, this same thing. Community radio stations did interviews with local uh, people involved in this fight uh, and connecting all of it uh, to uh, social media action and just physical action, what, what you can do about it. That story then would echo across the land. People would hear about it uh, for the first time, not from one source or this source, but they would say, well, something big is going uh, on here. So uh, my uh, basic message to you is that this is an effort that is worthy of us uh, because we're not just trying to build uh, an independent media, we're building democracy. Uh, without the media, you're not going to have democracy. So that's the fight we're involved in. I am Jeff Chester, Center for Digital Democracy. I share Jim's uh, vision. We're in a global transition, and that's that cross device commercial surveillance system where the technology allows for individuals and groups to be constantly tracked, surveilled, analyzed, profiled, scored, so you can be targeted with interactive advertising and other forms of micro-persuasion. Now we've, and as I said, Google and Facebook are kind of the dominant forms here in the United States and in many places around the world, but companies all over the world, media companies all over the world, are using these new, these new big data digital technologies, and Fortune 1000 companies now recognize there are no more barriers for them to distribute their branded content. They create, and they have created their own channels, their own social media platforms, they're engaged in huge forms of social media surveillance, resentment mining. So the corporations, I think, even though there's a lot of good news, I tend to kind of look at, based on the business practices, what do we have to be worried about? And I think we need to be worried because it's a very powerful form designed principally for commercial intent but it works best for those that have the most money. And special interest groups on the left and right are beginning to use it, but I think our voices for just democracy will be marginalized. We have other, unless we intervene. So we have other challenges too. We, you know, we have, well, we have opportunity. We have the growth of the progressive movement, particularly the Sanders campaign and Black Lives Matter that I think gives us the kind of political weight that frankly media activists like myself haven't seen in, in a long, long time. And we know we have a decline in civic discourse and journalism and a tabloid culture. Okay, so what can we do? And I was, it, it, I'm always inspired by Ralph, as we all, we all seem to be. And it was great to see him on the Donahue show, what a fighter he has been. And trying to think about what we can do. And I said this morning, I actually think that one of the goals should be, and for the first time I think we can actually do it, we should try to take back the public spectrum. You know, they gave it to the broadcasters, they're auctioning it off. It's a huge amount of wealth and private property. And it seems to me that we're at a moment when people are concerned about corporate giveaways and corporate control, that we actually can put this issue in play and, and figure out a way, maybe it's John Nichols, you know, uh, with a 20 bucks or 200 bucks voucher, but figure out a way that in fact we can change the broadcast spectrum policy. So instead of allowing the media companies to profit from this property, it creates a funding mechanism for, for public interest discourse. I don't think it's out of the question. So look, here's an idea. And it's probably been, it's probably, uh, uh, been proposed many, many times, but I think that Ralph should create the digital media big data, uh, big 
digital media, big, big data era raiders. To, to, on a fast track, to identify the challenges, the opportunities, to provide the effective critique like they did in the 1960s, like Mark Green and others did to help you know, revitalize the Federal Trade Commission, bring in you know, the, the Sanders people, bring in Black Lives Matter, let's make this about equity and diversity and social justice, but come up with short-term plans connected to a political strategy around the spectrum. I think we should try to get people I know there are groups here and activists here to get Bernie to put in the Democratic platform that the spectrum is public property. We're going to stop auctioning it off, and the money's going to go to the people. We should put that issue in play. It could possibly work. I don't think it's been able to be possible over these last 30 years, even though Ralph has talked about it. I think it's possible now. We need to challenge the business practices. We need somebody out there saying, no, this commercial surveillance system that Google and Facebook and Coca-Cola and others have created is, is wrong, and here's what we have to do to protect privacy. As I said this morning, it's because of Google and Facebook and the, their powerful lobby that we don't have privacy legislation in the United States. They tried to derail the European one. That just went through, and they'll have a great one in two years. We need to protect privacy here. And by the way, the Federal Communications Commission, for whatever reason, is following up on its network neutrality initiative. Hopefully you'll be getting an email soon from Free Press. We have a real opportunity for privacy for the ISPs. We need new ideas for, for, for ownership, for programmatic opportunity and diversity. How do we make, see the big data model is going to affect the streaming system too. It's already in play. As I mentioned this morning, it's called programmatic advertising. It's the collection of data, the profiling, and the delivery of the video content. I'm concerned that we even get frozen out, except for those people who can pay. So what does the new ownership patterns look like to bring diversity? What can we do about non-commercial media? We should, should let that go. What can we do about journalism? What needs to be done about journalism? The same big data-driven system operating in the, uh, in the commercial media overall it is in fact shaping the future of journalism. Some people are worth more to advertisers. Some content will be different based on what you're worth. Some people are, in the words of the industry, considered waste. Do you know what the advertisers call us when they put us up for 20, uh, millise 20 millisecond auctions in real time? to sell us to advertisers, we're inventory. We're not people, we're inventory. Well, that journalism is taking on that kind of perspective as well. We need to try to figure out what we can do around elections and, and ads and campaigns. You know, that also raises privacy issues and other issues, but they have so much digital information. All the political campaigns, including Bernie, are using these very powerful big data tactics to identify people, to get them to vote. But that also means that money in politics in terms of the digital delivery system of advertising, because remember, it's cross-platform now. We just don't have television, you know, and, and the mobile device, and even and the gaming device, and television is now increasingly a part of it. You have, you, you're, you're able, you need to program cross-device, but you're now able to target and follow that individual, regardless of what device they're on, and regardless of when it is, because they have your geolocation information. I'm concerned about the impact of digital advertising in the political process, because it's an individual message, and what does that truly um, mean. And just kind of finally, because people talked about this today, it is a global movement. Um, you know, these trends that I talk about are happening all over the world. A lot of it is precipitated by American companies, by Google and Facebook that have brought their business models uh, elsewhere. Uh, but there are a lot of alliances uh, to be made. And I didn't mention it this morning, but one of my concerns about this hyper-commercialism model, you know, when you see it at work in China, for example, where they're sending out, you know, like they are sell, send out here billions and billions of ads, it's about consumption without any limit, without any constraint, with no differentiation about buying a car or buying junk food or buying anything. That's, just, that's their vision uh, of the world, and we need to link with global activists and, um, and create a more just media system. And I think that's basically it for me. And then, we have one minute and 30 seconds. Do you want to say something? Uh, well, I, I would just say, uh, just as uh, young people uh, have uh, re uh, completely revolutionized uh, politics, uh, you know, it's, it's not through by any means, but clearly that's what's underway. I mean, even the question of whether political parties are necessary. Is, has now been uh, raised uh, in, uh, this uh, 
uh, they're going to do this. And so my advice to Ralph, if you want to you say we need Ralph's uh, Raiders on uh, this media, I agree with that. But uh, what he needs uh, is uh, 47 uh, people who are 18 to 21 years of age and, and say, what should we do, <laughs> basically? Because uh, I think that's for the power I, I agree. So thank, thank, you thank you all. You. Keep up the good work. We had a little talk about uh, commercial intelligence in the last panel. Now we're going to go into the big, 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 big uh, boogeyman in the United States, which is uh, government intelligence. And we have two people who played a key role uh, in exposing the reality of the depth of the intelligence gathering of various federal agencies. They've had high-level intelligence roles. They've received awards from intelligence communities for combined probably about 60 years they have experience uh, working in U.S. intelligence uh, and they have now a very different view of what the intelligence agencies do. They travel the country and the world uh, telling people about what U.S. agencies are doing on intelligence gathering. Uh, you know, and so please welcome these two really uh, heroes who have t put, taken the risk and done it in such a smart way that they have still not been prosecuted. Uh, so please welcome Kurt Wiebe and William Benny. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, and uh, thanks for inviting us here. Uh, we're we're trying to spread the word. This is certainly part of uh, one of the one of the mechanisms we have to do that because we've had very uh, di very difficult time getting our story out. Some of it was uh, misuse of government agencies. Some of it was misuse of law and the FBI. But uh, a lot of it was also because of uh, investigative journalism and uh, the mainstream media not actually uh, getting involved in doing their job under the Constitution to find out what the government's really doing. So they've been, uh, they've been a party indirectly by not investigating and being, uh, you know, I guess you can understand that they, they don't want to lose access to power or uh, information. Uh, so, so that's sort of a motivator for them so they can stay on top of news stories. But when you do that, you only get one side, and that's the narrative out of the government. And that means that's all you hear. Now, this has been typical of uh, dictatorial states down through history, and any historian will tell you that every, every, the process that they've adopted of collecting data on everybody on the planet, first starting in the United States, uh, is, a is a totalitarian process. It goes back to Caesar Augustus and back into the Egyptian days. I mean, anyone in power wanted to stay in power. That meant you have to know what your population is doing so you can control it. You know, attack certain segments if they're not doing what, what you want them to do. So <clears throat> in our story, uh, Kirk and I were together uh, in a uh, what we called the SIGIN Automation Research Center. We were automating the analysis of data, uh, which is something they can't do today. Uh, and it's the main reason they continually fail to stop terrorist attacks or anything else. I mean, they're good at entrapping people, but uh, otherwise, <laughs> and they're good at collecting data, but they're not very good at all at understanding what they've collected. And they demonstrate that year after year, like in Paris or Brussels or Boston, 9-11 or any of the other, even, even in the Garland, Texas case, uh, uh, in that case, I use it as a typical, as the, as the one to show what they should be doing and they, which then they're not. Uh, the Garland police were tipped off two days in advance that that attack was coming by a member of Anonymous. Now that member of Anonymous was looking at a social network, during, focusing, uh, doing, and looking at uh, specific people who were threatening to take some action, violent action, and they watched them, uh, which is the job our police and intelligence agencies are supposed to do. But uh, neither of uh, our side, uh, for which we pay a little over $100 billion a year for intelligence, uh, not counting police, uh, we, we got no alert from them that this attack was coming, but from this member of Anonymous, we did. Why? Because the member of Anonymous focused, had a disciplined, focused attack on, you know, on a target that was threatening something. These people, uh, in our intelligence agencies, they already knew these people too, but they didn't focus. Why? Because they're collecting so much data on everybody on the planet that you can't see the threat coming. That's the real problem. That's why. Uh, that's why I said originally, uh, years ago, that they basically treated the security of the people in the United States and the free world for money. Because it was all about money, because to collect everything, it takes an awful lot of money. 
They've spent almost a trillion dollars of our tax money on intelligence since 9-11. That's how much money it's all about. That's why, that's why we knew when we put together our program to do it smartly in a targeted, focused way, we knew from staffers in the House Intelligence Committee that the, uh, the companies that wanted to feed off all this money were in Congress lobbying against us to get our, our, our uh, program canceled because it was a threat to the feeding process. Um, and so, <clears throat> and of course, NSA management bought into that, of course. They had to have an industrialized solution, you know. Uh, and that's the way they took it. So that's, that meant that the, they killed our program even before 9-11. Um, and, uh, but, but, but you see, what we had done in our program was to be able to handle fiber optic rates and very massive amounts of data. They had no other program like that in NSA. So when it came time after 9-11 to start spying on everybody, they had to take the components we put together, remove all the filtering and, and monitoring and, uh, and uh, privacy protection uh, software that we had in that code, and then just use it to collect everything and just store it and build graphs of social relationships of everybody on the planet. But first, we started with US citizens. So, uh, I first heard about that in the second week of October of 2001. Um, and, and when they when they told me that it was obvious to me that uh, you know the highest levels of government approved this and that's what they were that's where they were heading toward a totalitarian state this is a direct violation of the first fourth fifth and sixth amendments of the constitution and any number of other laws including those governing FCC regulations and so on so I I uh, went immediately to the House Intelligence Committee and Kirk and I went there and uh, we talked about this and said this is what they're doing this is a direct violation of everything we're supposed to stand for. Um, and, and from there on, uh, we were complaining internally, that, and the staffers inside the House were, were taking a court of gauze and Nancy Pelosi trying to argue the case that this is a direct violation of the Constitution and, and laws, uh, and that went nowhere. Why? Because those two members of the House were already approved the program on the 4th of October, 2001. So they had already bought into the program. And the whole idea from that point on was to keep it as secret as possible. Don't even tell members of Congress or the other members of the intelligence committees or any of the courts except for the senior uh, uh, judge on the FISA court. And it stayed that way up until I think the New York Times article came out in 2005. Then of course it was exposed and everybody knew that they weren't being told the truth. Well, you're still not being told the truth because they're capturing massive amounts of content for our communication, the voice, the email, and so on. They're still not addressing that. Now in the UK they are, but over here they're not. So we attempted to get that voice out. Kirk and I both went to the, the uh, Inspector Generals of the Department of Defense and the, and the uh, Department of Justice. And of course along the line we got two noticed by our government so they sent the FBI at us. So they raided us, took all our material, uh, basically threatened uh, my family with guns drawn. They didn't do it to Kirk's family. but. Uh, then uh, after that, uh, in order to keep us quiet and off balance, they sent the Department of Justice at us, and they, three separate times between 2007 and 2010, they attempted to indict us under espionage acts. So they wanted to put us away like they did with Chelsea Manning or like they wanted to do with uh, Julian Assange, uh, uh, put you away for at least 35 years, uh, and they were fabricating evidence because they didn't have it. We weren't uh, involved in anything that the New York Times published or any of that, but that's what they accused us of. Yeah, and so uh, from that, uh, uh, I was starting to assemble all the evidence I could of malicious prosecution on the part of the Department of Justice of the United States. And the third time they did that, the third time they attempted to indict us all, uh, I uh, had all this evidence assembled so I called Tom Brady, assuming his phone was tapped by the FBI, that they would report to the Department of Justice everything I told him. I said, Tom, our lawyer said that they're now going to indict us on this charge about we had a meeting in, you know, Turk Valley Club in Maryland. And uh, he said, uh, I said, uh, now, I, I, I haven't talked to my lawyer yet, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to accuse them of malicious prosecution, and here's all the evidence I've assembled. I read it off on the phone to him. So I was trying to let the... I wanted to get, to, get to, to know what all the evidence was. And I said, and Tom, tell your lawyer because uh, I'm going to charge them with malicious prosecution when, when they charge us and take us to court. So I had the goods on them, and it was, it was pretty obvious. I mean, it was clearly something that was provable uh, in a court of law. So 
Uh, after that, one month later, Kirk and I got letters of immunity, unsolicited from the Department of Justice. <laughs> And it's, e it's even worse than that because uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, oh, but maybe a year later or so, uh, someone in the Department of Justice, not everybody there is, a, is a bad or evil, uh, felt very bad about what they were trying to do to us. So they sent us a copy of their draft indictment on us. So we have all the lies that they were assembling in their draft indictment. They even had Ed Loomis at the meeting and he wasn't there. <laughs> so, you know, it, it wasn't hard to figure out who they were talking about. So. So that, that, was the, that was the story we had. Then, we, then at that point, it, it was where we basically decided that this is not acceptable uh, in this, in this uh, country. That this government is so evil that it has to be publicly addressed. And at that point, we went public. Now, the first one we met with Jane Mayer in 2011. She wrote an article, then Jim Bamford did one in Wired, and 60 Minutes did a program. And then uh, Democracy Now! And, uh, and, uh, and, and a little bit on Fox, a couple programs on Fox, and it kind of died off. And, and they're only basically regurgitating the uh, iterative, iterations out of the White House and the agencies now, and they're not getting a, a balanced view of uh, what's really been going on. So uh, it's been hard to get the information out because uh, mainstream media is the ve vector you, you would hope, according to the Constitution, we have a free press, so they're supposed to report what the government's doing, but they're not really effectively doing that job now. So that's really basically our story. We're still fighting now. I mean, we're talking to different members of parliaments in different European countries, uh, and, and like three separate lawsuits in the federal and the appeals courts, one in the Second Circuit, one in the Third, one in the Eleventh, all challenging the constitutionality. This is what the government's so afraid of. They're afraid of a challenge to constitutionality because they know it's not. I mean, that's why that bulk collection of, uh, of uh, commercial records was illegal. I mean, the Second Circuit ruled that because it's collecting data on U.S. citizens in bulk with, I mean, they're supposed to list the names of everybody they're after, all the data they're after, and the reason they're after, probable cause. Well, when you issue like that, uh, that uh, general warrant to Verizon, give me all the records of 110 million U.S. citizens that are also customers of you, and all the things they've been doing, well, they should name everybody and list all the probable causes as to why they're doing that, and that's what they're not doing. That's the fourth So, so in my view, when they ask me, and I'll, I'll get, turn it over to Kirk in a minute. So in my view, when they ask me, what, on USA Today in 2013, uh, they asked me, what do I think should happen to Edward Snowden? They, you know, Edward did what he did because, you know, what happened to us and Tom Drake. Uh, I said, uh, I thought that Tom, uh, uh, Edward Snowden should be indicted for stealing government property. Uh, but that the laws should be applied equally and in the chronological sequence of the crimes committed. So that meant we had to first go against Bush, Cheney, Hayden, Tennant, all the attorneys, all the attorneys, all the, all the members of the FISA court, uh, and all, the, uh, all those in the OLC office in the DOJ, plus all the other senior lawyers involved, and all the, all the senior personnel at NSA, CIA, FBI. Uh, involved, and then after we do the Bush administration, we do the same people in the Obama administration. You heard that um, some years back, a few years back, um, the case of, of uh, James Risen of Fox News, who had his phone tapped by the government. I can tell you with an extreme amount of confidence that the powers that be in this nation are monitoring re the actions of reporters and their sources of information to such an extent that the major media are sensitive to that and it is making the major media reluctant to tell you, the audience, anything that could upset your view of our government. Uh, this is a real concern. You know, I spent most of my life, and so did this man here, studying the Soviet Union, trying to protect this nation against any actions against this nation by the Soviet Union. And we got to be experts after a while. And I can tell you, some of the behavior I now see in the U.S. government is exactly what we saw when we studied the, the uh, Soviet Union. 
exactly. I will also tell you that because of what Bill mentioned a few minutes ago, it's unnecessary. We know of a way to monitor communications and mass without disrupting the privacy of innocent people. NSA doesn't want to hear it. The Congress ought to subpoena us in front of the intelligence uh, committees or in front of a larger body, all of Congress for all I care, and have us tell them what we're talking about because they don't want to hear it. There's too many money interests involved. The status quo is what they're trying to hold on to. They wouldn't be able to defend it had we had a day in court, so to speak. But it's absolutely, uh, there's absolutely no reason to trade privacy for security based on the software solution that we know how to implement on a grand scale for the entire government and put this constitutional crisis to bed. <laughs> Now, let me tell you a story about the press. <clears throat> about three years ago, maybe it was four, as I get older, time passes so quickly. Um, I received a phone call from um, Catherine Herridge of Fox News. Some, and this has not been published anywhere, so consider it a first heard by this audience. Um, Catherine said, Kirk, Fox wants to do two things. They want to do a docu documentary about you and Bill and Ed Loomis and Tom Drake and Diane Moore. But they also want to do uh, some shorter snippets that they could embellish Brett Baer's special report with on the evening news at six. So what we'd like to do is to each of your homes, and she was asking me to communicate this to the rest of the folks, the rest of the whistleblowers. Um, what we'd like to do is come out with a full film crew, film you extensively in interviews and around the house and, and so that the audience can kind of get to know each of you, and then um, go to air with it. And we all agreed to do it, all of us. And then Fox must have spent three to four hours at each of our homes, so that's times five. Uh, lots of film involved and so forth. And they brought two producers, one to worry about the documentary, one to worry about the shorter clips for the uh, special report. And um, they came, they did their thing, we went through makeup, the whole nine yards, Bill and I did, Tom, Diane, all of us, and they went away. And we heard absolutely nothing. So I called one day and I said, Catherine, what's happened to the documentary? What's happened to the evening news clips? And she said, there's been a change. I don't know who's responsible for making it, but I don't know. I don't really have a good answer for you. And so I said, okay, we'll leave it at that, see what happens. Nothing did happen. And the whole matter was buried. About a year later, I got a phone call in my car on myself from Catherine Herridge. She said, Kirk, you're not going to believe it. Now this is, I'm curious already, because normally reporters don't call you with information. They call you asking questions. And um, she said, you're not going to believe this, but do you remember the producer for the documentary piece? And I said, I sure do. And I remember her name. Catherine said, she now works for the National Security agency. Now, it takes about a year to get there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that, that about floored me because it certainly confirms suspicions that the United States intelligence infrastructure, meaning all the various organizations, is in the business of trying to manipulate the news. They are actively doing it. They're not just listening in. I think they're putting plants in the major media. The major media know it. They're intimidated. They're frightened. And so I pose to you this. If the major media cannot tell us the truth, the only thing you're left with is smaller outlets like the Real News Network carrying this broadcast and whistleblowers. That's it. No textbook. No source, no font of knowledge is going to enlighten you with truth. This nation is at a crisis point. 
And if we don't fix it, we're going to lose the constitutional republic we once put together over 200 years ago. Thank all of you. talking about our, our program to, to be able to do a focused, disciplined, professional job to get data and give everybody privacy at the same time. Uh, Congress, of course, didn't uh, call us down to testify, which we were hoping for. But uh, uh, when I was testifying to the Bundestag in Germany, the German parliament, uh, the, the congressional committee sent representatives to go listen. And I said, well, I'm only 20 miles up the road. You know, you come down any time. But you know, it's a, so. In, and so, our government has rejected our, our approach uh, because they're not doesn't cost enough money and it doesn't uh, add a, a perpetual problem. You know, it solves the problem. So uh, they didn't want to hear about it. So we're putting it on the web for everybody in the world to read. Uh, the website is goodamerican.org, um, and it's it's a it's about a, it's based on a movie about uh, me primarily, but Kirk's in it as are the others. Uh, uh, it's called A Good American. Um, I thought it should... Uh, it's about my, my history at NSA, what I... My... Oh, oh, sure, yeah, sure. Well, it's done very simply. Uh, it's like everybody, uh, uh, the policing organizations do, are supposed to have uh, a probable cause to go after you, which means they have to have some behavioral property to say, I'm going to target you or I'm going to stop you, or whatever. Uh, so it's all based on deductive, inductive, and abductive logic, based on behavioral properties in data and how people communicate, who they communicate with. Uh, for example, you, the, the, the movie explains it pretty well, I think. Uh, it, it explains how you graph the relationships of everybody on the planet, and how you can pick out uh, uh, terrorists and see their social networks and focus only on that the terrorists and their, their close proximity uh, net, social network, which means that you have a high probability of people involved. So those are the people who fall into the zone of suspicion around the terrorists. That doesn't mean they're guilty, it means you have to look at them. So there's behavioral properties that means you look at them. It has nothing to do with profile, just that property. That's the deductive approach. Inductive is uh, when you have look at websites that uh, uh, advocate pedophilia, or that uh, advocate terrorism or jihad and things like that, and you watch who visits those sites. So you're looking at the properties of people looking at that particular activity, implying they become suspicious, they need to be looked at. So that's the probable cause for that. Then abductively, you look in a general sense about networks around the world, one of the ways of doing it, uh, and you look at countries where the, uh, terrorism is high, high probability, like in Afghanistan, Pakistan, you know, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and so on. And then you look at the social networks and see if, if just they randomly distribute that way. I mean, you can tell everybody on the, on the worldwide network in real time as the data is passing by, simply because, for example, in the phone numbering system, every number of every phone is unique in the world. So you know, first of all, if they're fixed, where they are, if they're mobile, where they came from, or you can look at GPS and see where they are that time. Or in the, in the internet world, it's the IP uh, address, IPv4, 6, it's a numbering scheme again, dividing the world up into zones. And the same is uh, true with machine access codes and things like that. Uh, things, identifiers that are clear that can be used to say, this is where this social air network is distributed. Well, if you look at things that are distributed primarily in zones uh, where terrorism is uh, prevalent, then that means you need to look at that network because based on that uh, distribution behavior. Okay, so we have reasons for doing things, not just scooping up everybody. And all the rest of the data on everybody on the planet gets, passes right by. And you can make these decisions online without any, that's what we were doing in real time. Uh, is that what? No, Britain's doing uh, everything that NSA is doing. Collecting everything. In fact, uh, I testified to the House of Lords that bulk acquisition is, uh, means people die first and then you clean up the mess afterwards because you can't get to the data to, to discover the threat. And, and uh, they said, you mean to tell me that all of the members of the House, and, uh, or the, not the House, but the Parliament, and, uh, and, uh, and the agencies that have come through here testifying to us up to now been lying? I said, yes, I guess I am. <laughs> I mean, they just have too much money and too much access, too much power.
with the companies, with the ISP servers, with the providers, with the networks, they're tapping all the networks. I mean, Fairview is the main network they used to tap the United States. Go on the web and Google NSA space Fairview, one word, and you'll see the map of about 100 taps, 80 to 100 taps inside the fiber network with the United States. If they were after foreigners, they'd only be along the coast, but this is distributed right with the population. So you know you are the target. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Drake and John Kiriakou and many others, these are the silent patriots who are silent no more. Uh, very ethical, dynamic whistleblowers, something our country can uh, use a lot more of. Uh, I want to describe uh, briefly uh, what uh, I'd like to come out of this uh, conference and a lot of people would like to come out. And that is a, a, a new organization which we would call Voices and we'd like to support them. Uh, authors, publishers, writers, musicians, documentary filmmakers, everybody wants more voice, wants more readers, want, wants more uh, listeners and uh, participants uh, in a robust democracy. And describing voices, and I'll give some uh, uh, rather uh, specific illustrations of what we'll do. Uh, it, its purpose is simple, it's to push for enlarging and enhancing space for serious content in all forms of media. We have to have a serious society here. We have a hedonistic industry, we have an entertainment, a sports society. We have to have a serious society, if only to survive for a hedonistic society, and an entertainment society, and a sports society. Voices would be, would be staffed by writers, traditional social media specialists, organizers, public interest lawyers. It will advance long neglected standards in 1934 Communications Act, which contains the imperative that broadcasters meet the public interest, convenience, and necessity, and other laws under the jurisdiction of the FCC. The Voices staff will make the case, again and again, for much more airtime on TV, radio, in space, and print publications, by a multitude of subject matter, issues, and activities that are now excluded or censored routinely as an entertainment industry can only do. That is driven by maximum profit at all times. It would also involve a return of the public airways for a specified amount of time every day to an audience network, an audience network by uh, people who believe in a media democracy. And it would be funded by uh, charging the broadcasters rent. They, they use our public airways, our public property, free. 